Hello, Spark fans, and welcome back to Advancing Spark. Now, we have a topic today which some people consider super, super interesting and incredibly valuable. Some people consider the most boring thing known to man. We are talking about encryption and decryption on the fly. Yeah, why not? So one of the real big problems with uh, data management systems in the world of data protection is how you deal with data that people can't see. How do you hide data from people who shouldn't be able to see it? How do you guarantee to people you're treating the data with the kind of care and respect that you would want someone to treat your data? Especially if you're in Europe and you're dealing with GDPR. If you're in the US, you're dealing with the California data protection. If you're wherever and dealing with wherever's data protection laws, you need to consider how you're actually treating that data. Now, in the warehousing world, in traditional sort of SQL Server databases, we've had the ability to decrypt data and uh, to encrypt data and then decrypt it and then be able to do decryption on the fly and that kind of thing. And that's really, really cool. And it's been awkward to do it in the lake. We've had to have, well, there's my obfuscated version of the data. There's a completely different table which holds the unobfuscated. And then we have table access control or we have lake folder security. Essentially, we have to have two copies of the data and that's rubbish. So we've been looking at how we can use the brand new encryption and decryption functions in Databricks Runtime 10.3 to do decryption on the fly, to look up a decryption record and then use it only if you've got access to that actual particular decryption record. How can you use row level security to do dynamic decryption? And that's actually quite cool. So there's some interesting patterns. I'm gonna give you a quick walk through the two new encrypt and decrypt functions. And then I'm going to show you a row level security dynamic decryption pattern, because why not? As always, if it is your first time around here, don't forget to like and subscribe. Let me know down in the comments if you've got another pattern that you've used to do the same thing. Always interested to see what weird and wacky work with, uh, workarounds people have come up with. But yeah, let's have a look. So as I mentioned, 10.3, the latest Databricks runtime, we saw these two new Spark SQL functions introduced. You get AES encrypt and ANS AES decrypt. Now you pass it the value you want to uh, encrypt. In this case, we're going to encrypt the value of hello Spark fans. Why not? Uh, and then I'm, you need to pass it a 16, 24, or 32 bit key, character key, to then use as your encryption key. So I'm going to encrypt this string using this key. Yeah, I can just run that. And you can see I get this encrypted value back. That is my base 64 encoded because it's coming to my output version of that key. Now, it's important that we know if I'm copying and pasting it from the output, it has been encoded so it can be shown on the in the browser, uh, annoyingly, because we'll have to do a little bit of funny business to get at the data. If I try and uh, decrypt that directly, not going to like it. We go, what? No, that's not a thing. What are you talking about? So weirdly, um, I actually have to do an unbase 64 uh, around that for it to actually recognize that that's the thing that can then be decrypted. So that's that's happy. That's said, okay, yeah, I can decrypt that. And it's returned me this. Now, that's actually the correct value. That is the correct decrypted thing, but it's not shown as a string. So actually, I need to, whoops. If I just wrap this in a string, I'm going to cast that whole thing as a string. See, that's my actual output. Now, that tripped me up for ages. I was basing coding it, unbasing it, wrapping it in a thing and going, what? Why is it not telling me my actual value? And it's only when you cast it back to a string and it's like, right, I had, I do have the data. I've accessed it. It's fine. So a little bit of nuance to it. That's all. So AS decrypt, useful. You pass it the thing, you pass it the encryption key. It will decrypt it. The type of value it'll return. If you're trying to decrypt a string, you just need to cast it as a string and then all seems fine, all seems happy. So there are two new functions. So AES encrypt takes the string, turns it into an encrypted value. AES decrypt, shockingly enough, takes an encrypted value, un uh, decrypts it back into a thing, and you might need to tell it that it is a string. Okay, so super useful, fairly basic. Encrypt, decrypt, wrap it in a function, all good. How do we actually use that to do some more interesting stuff? Let's have a look. So I'm going to create a new uh, Hive database, calling it Crypt. Why not? Uh, and I'm going to do this. So I'm making a lookup table. And in my lookup table, I'm going to hold the various encryption keys I use. So each record 
isn't going to be encrypted with the same key. Because if I do, then I just have carte blanche. I can just apply any that key to any record and it'll encrypt. Instead, what I'm going to say is each record, I'm going to use a different key to encrypt it with. And that means if I have access to the record that holds that decryption key, then I can decrypt the record. If I don't have access to that record, I can't get at what the actual values are. So I'm making this table. I'm dumping it into the lake. I'm just calling it crypt.decrypto. So it's just a little reference table. And then I'm going to have a separate context table. It's going to have a name, an email address, and the group they belong to. And it's going to be the group that will do some kind of row level security around so creating that basic table. Okay, so we've got two things. We have our actual encrypted data, and then we have a reference table of what the key was used to encrypt each, each bit. And then hooking that up. If I go to our decrypto, or basically our, our list of encryption keys, I've got two records. So I've got one for American customers. I'm going to use this encryption key. I'm going to call that the USA as the group name. For British customers, I'm going to use a different encryption key. and call that GBR. I'm just going to insert that into my lookup table. So I'll then have that as a reference. Now, anytime I'm inserting a customer who's from the USA group, I'll use that encryption key. Anytime I'm inserting a record from the GBR group, I'll use the second encryption key. And then if I wanted to say, right, I need to lose all of my GBR customers. All I need to do is remove that key from that table, and then I can no longer decrypt any data that belongs to the GBR group. I'm centralizing decryption by creating a separate lookup table. Okay, so I've got that. Real simple table that has those two records in there. And then I'm doing this. So I've got two fictional people, Bob, Bob Bobbington and Bill Billington. Uh, Bob works for Microsoft, Bill works for Databricks. Uh, and Bob is from the USA and Bill is from GBR, right? Uh, and then what I'm doing is I'm joining that to my encryption table uh, by that group. You see, against Bob, it's done a lookup against which group USA is in. And it said, okay, well, the encryption key for USA is that key. But Bill has done the same, except it looked up the GBR and it's given me a different key. Now against each record, I've got the key that I should use to encrypt and decrypt that data. So now when I take that, if I want to write that data down into the lake, I can just wrap it in that AES encrypt, pass in the encryption key as a parameter, and then I'll use different encryption keys for each of the records. So we can go ahead and do that. And I insert into my contacts table, I'm taking AES encrypt around the name and using the encryption key, using AES encrypt around the email and using the encryption key, and I'm including the group so I can look back and get back to what key was used. So if we actually take that, if I just comment that out, we can see what that would do. We can see the name has been encrypted, the email has been encrypted, and I've got the original group. So if I don't have access to that kind of uh, encryption lookup table, I can't get it. I have no idea how to decrypt that. I can't work out what that data is. So I'm kind of making a safe, protected version of the data in there. So let's insert that into our contacts table. Okay. Now, I'm going to do some row level security. So, a long, like quite a while ago now, we had this thing, the isMember function. Now, isMember will tell you, is the currently logged in person? You can see I'm logged in as Simon at advancinganalytics.co.uk. Is my current login a member of a particular group? Now, that group of USA, GBR, that lookup, I've actually gone ahead and created as database groups. So, if we go look around. Uh, if we go down to my settings, into my admin console, I can have a look at groups. I can see I've got F FRA, I've got GBR, I've got USA. If I look in USA, yes, I am a member of that group. If I look inside GBR, yes, I'm a member of that group. So currently, I can see both of those uh, data sets. So if I go and create that view, mm -mm -mm. whoops. Uh, so if I create that view up here, and then I just do a quick select star from my decrypt allowed. Okay. Probably use more sensible table names, but easy. So, okay. So we can see me currently, if I select from that table, I can see all of those encryption keys. Now, if we change that around, if I go back to my settings, I'm going to remove myself from the USA group. So, okay, get rid of him, remove member. He's no longer allowed access to the USA. Not true, I've not done anything. Uh, we can go and have a look. There we go. So 
So role level security is done by adding a filter using that is member. And all that's going to do is saying, which are the encryption keys that I have access to? It's going to bring that back as a record. And so I can see the decryption key for British customers. I can't see the decryption key for USA customers. Now, rather than this either just literally taking records out, meaning I can't see that record exists, I can still actually apply it dynamically. So the final step, final step in all of this stuff is to then join back to that table. So I'm going to do a select. I'm going to do an AES decrypt of the name, an AES decrypt of the email. I'm doing the look of the encryption key. So I'm joining my contacts table. So my table that has the encrypted data, I'm joining it to that view that has the row level security on there using the group name. Now, if I've got access to the data, I'll see the decrypted value. If I don't, I'll just get nulls back because I'm doing a left join. Therefore, it's going to pass a null in as the um, decryption value, the decryption key. Therefore, it can't return it. But you can see in this case, I'm getting my data back. I've got the right number of rows. If I had other fact transaction style info in here, my record would be preserved. But things I've classed as sens uh, sensitive, things I've encrypted, I can't decrypt and I just get nulls back. And I could wrap that with a, a value, a default value or something like that. Let's go and test that. I'm going to give myself access back into USA. Allowed back in. Add me in. Bring me over. Go. Too zoomed in. Go. Confirm. If I take a step back now. Rerun that same thing. And now because I'm now a member of that group, I can decrypt it and I suddenly get the value added. So dynamic decryption or nullification of values depending on an is member statement using row level security but not having to set up row level security on every single table that uses this data because that was the alternative right i mean so i don't want to have to set up that same row level security and include a group include a reference name on absolutely everything if i can actually centralize that stuff because what we're trying to get to is if i wanted to say you know it's the right to be forgotten uh certainly in the uh, uk or eu uh, GDPR rules. Someone rings up and says, I don't want you to have my data and there's no legitimate business reason for you to have my data rather than just marketing at me. And they go, yeah, okay, yeah, fine. We'll delete your data. And then if they have to go around every single different bit of information looking for my name and deleting it, that's really, really painful. Whereas if I've centralized the decryption of that particular person, and I can go to that one central table and say, delete that record, or at least null out the encryption key. And then if I've got all these different tables that at runtime are checking against that table to decrypt it, suddenly they can't decrypt it and I've deleted that data. I have no possible way of decrypting that now without having to do a load of different write statements against a load of different tables. So if we do that as an example and say, right, okay, I've lost the contract with the British uh, group. I'm, I need to trash all of my contact details for that GBR group, set the encryption key to null. I'm updating a single record and now anywhere that was using that GBR encryption key, if I go and run this again, I've not even changed my groups or anything, I just no longer have access to GBR data and I've got no way of decrypting that. I have destroyed that data without deleting the records or without going and doing a ton of updates. So, super interesting pattern. Obviously, there is a runtime overhead of having to decrypt things on the fly. There is, you need to actually sort of, you know, take that into account of you're doing an extra join, you're doing an extra decryption on every single row that goes through. But if you need that level of protection, it's certainly a hell of a lot easier than having to have so many duplicate copies of your data, one that's encrypted, one that's not encrypted, and then having to manage security of all that stuff. Instead, it's manage one central table and then just use that as in your view layer across all of your different data. And suddenly there's a load of interesting stuff you can do with control. Hmm. Cool. So it may have seemed like two really small things in that data rich runtime 10.3. Yeah, we've now got an AES encrypt and an AES decrypt. Great. But the patterns that it unlocks and the problems that solves in terms of how people have been trying to build big, modern, production grade lake houses. Lake houses which are trying to say we are just as uh, secure, just as performant, just as governed as a traditional data warehouse. This is the kind of stuff that really unlocks so much value there. So super interesting stuff. Hopefully that little pattern 
is sparking some ideas, sparking, <laughs> and you're like, yeah, okay, what? There's lots of different things you can use that for. Now, it's not quite dynamic data masking. It's not quite saying, well, actually, if it's an email, apply this pattern and leave the domain uncovered. There's, there's things you can do that are more advanced in other relational things, sure. But as a way of managing data protection, as a way of managing data, it's a really nice little pattern. And yeah, hopefully it is interesting. I got more to do. We have Databricks news coming soon, and I'll catch you next time. Cheers.